What's up everybody, Pastor Matt here. Thanks for checking into the YouTube channel. Well, um, I am recording this as our church is just a couple of days away from celebrating the Lord's Supper, which we do once a month on the first Sunday of every month. Now your church may be like ours and following that practice of doing monthly communion. Uh, perhaps you even do it on the same week of the month that we do. On the first week of every month, you celebrate the Lord's Supper communion. Some churches, of course, do it far more frequently, uh, do it every single week, and others do it far less. Some do it quarterly or yearly or whatever else the pattern may be. But one of the things that we do, and I think this is good practice, is to announce to our congregation that the Lord's Supper is coming on the week prior, even though we already have this kind of established habit of receiving the Lord's Supper or communion on the first Sunday of the month. And the reason that we do that, the reason that we make this announcement, is because we want our people to be spending much of the week, or at least part of the week, in preparing their heart to receive the Lord's Supper. So we think that it's probably a very good idea that we would have some time in spiritual preparation, getting ourselves ready to come to uh, to the Lord's table. Now, um, obviously, if you forget that it's the Lord's Supper and you just kind of stumble into church, maybe you forget about it. Maybe you look down in the bulletin. You're like, oh, my goodness, we have communion today. I still think that you could uh, probably do some work of due preparation of the heart, even during the service or in the time, the moments before the service starts or even part of the Lord's Supper liturgy is meant to to uh, to prepare us by way of confession and reminders of what the Lord has done uh, in his life, death, and resurrection, in his redemption through the cross, and then, of course, all of these things pointing towards the redemption uh, of grace. And, of course, the Lord's Supper is a picture of, of these things, and so you can prepare even in the moments of. But probably it would be best if you came to the Lord's Supper with a heart ready to meet the Lord, since communion, of course, is uh, communing with our God and with the people of God. And so there's some sense in which due preparation is ready for that. And I think uh, not only that, but the scriptures actually commend the preparation of the heart before we come to the Lord's table. And I'll just cite you a couple of places here. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, the Apostle Paul is giving the Corinthians a little bit of a taking to the woodshed about their practices of the Lord's Supper. They're messing up in a bundle of different ways. And one of the things that he says to them towards the end of the section in chapter 11 is that you ought to examine yourself before you uh, before you come to the table. And so how, well, how would you do that? And that's the purpose of this particular video is to kind of ask ourselves, how do we go about that process of self-examination? And not only in that text, but if you read the gospel texts themselves, um, the Lord announces to his disciples that one of them is the betrayer, as you know. And the disciples tend to go through this um, this kind of little rubric of each one of them asking, is it I, Lord? And so there they are asking themselves whether they are truly in the faith. And uh, they're surprised, it would seem, that one of them is a betrayer because all along Judas has carried on fairly well, that he is, he is truly one of them. And yet uh, all along he has been the son of perdition, right? So due preparation is totally appropriate and it's a very good thing. So the question is, how do you do that? Well, in this video, let me give you a couple of very short things. And I think this video should be brief. A couple of practical applications. Number one, take some time to go back and read through the gospel text before you come to the supper. That just seems obvious, right? If you're going to prepare your heart to come to the Eucharist, communion, Lord's table, whatever you like to call it in your congregation. Um, it would seem to make perfect sense that you would spend some time in the gospel accounts. You might think about, for instance, the fact that it was the Passover meal that the Lord consecrated and instituted as his Lord's Supper. We might think back to the deliverance narratives of uh, God redeeming his people out of slavery in Egypt. We may think of uh, the mighty works of God and the delivering of Moses and his people through the Red Sea. Uh, and of course, with particular reference to the plagues, the tenth plague, the the plague upon the firstborn son, in which it was the people of faith that marked their houses with the blood of the lamb on the on the door frames of the lintels of their homes, and that's where the destroying angel passed over the people of God in his redemptive mercies. And so it would be good for you, number one, to go through the gospel stories, at least one of the gospels, whether it's uh, Matthew chapter 26 or whether it's Luke chapter 22. Um, and just think back through the primary events in which the Lord teaches about um, what he is doing with kind of reappropriating the, uh, the redemption narrative of the Passover and now indicating that these uh, are signs and seals of his body and his blood 
which avail for the redemption of his people. So just go back through and read the gospel accounts. Um, secondly, it would seem to me entirely appropriate that we would spend some time uh, confessing our sins. Now, obviously, it's entirely appropriate to confess our sins generally, which is to say we, uh, we remind ourselves and we confess before the Lord that we are, we are sinful creatures, that we are very much like our four parents, Adam and Eve, in their, uh, their fall from grace in the garden. We may uh, confess very generally that we're sinners in thought, word, and deed, which is part of, uh, part of some of the formal confessional prayers that we often say in our liturgy. But then it's also probably very good for us to go through a specific set of, uh, of, of repentance-oriented prayers. And to me, the best way to do that is to simply work my way through the Ten Commandments themselves. And so that's very often one of the things that I do, um, not that I'm the spiritual model or anything far from it. But I tend to use the Ten Commandments as a very helpful um, chart or whatever you want to call it to to examine my heart, to look in the mirror, to look deep into my own soul and see all the ways that I'm, I'm erring in any particular day or season of my life. Starting off with the first commandment that we shall have no other gods and working our way to whatever idols we may find in our, in our hearts and then how we've maybe spoken or believed wrongly against the Lord and then to the second table of the law, the sins that we've committed against other people. And by the way, if you're looking for a little help in that, the Westminster larger catechism has a very good section on the Ten Commandments, which sometimes helps to expose some of the the inner dust and dirt and the grime in our hearts that just a superficial glance through the Ten Commandments might not yield some of those deep insights that uh, the larger catechism has. Next, I do want to go back to the, uh, the catechism here for just a moment because if you are reformed, and even if you're not, you know, our, our confessional documents do have some very helpful things to say about preparing the heart for the Lord's Supper. In fact, if you are uh, reformed and you have the larger catechism as one of your confessional statements, numbers 170 to 175 all pertain in a general sense to preparing one's heart to receive the Lord's Supper. So let me just read to you, if, if you'll permit me, from question number 171 which speaks directly to the very issue at hand here. Question 171 says, How were they that received the sacrament of the Lord's Supper to prepare themselves before they come unto it? Well, that's that's the state of the question, right? Well, here's the answer that the Catechism gives, I think very wisely. They that receive the sacrament of the Lord's Supper are, before they come, to prepare themselves thereunto, by examining themselves of their being in Christ. Okay, so am I a Christian? (laughs) Pretty important question, right? Uh, Is it I, Lord, is the question of the disciples there. Excuse me. Of their sins and their wants, which which means lacks. When it says wants, it means their lackings. All the ways that they failed, we've failed. Of the truth and measure of their knowledge, faith, repentance, love to God and to the brethren, charity, charity to all men, forgiving those that have done them wrong of their desires after Christ and of their new obedience and by renewing the exercises of these grace by serious meditation and fervent prayer. Okay, so you could kind of go back through that whole answer. I know we kind of went through it very quickly and just think about each one of those clauses in that paragraph, each one of those uh, phrases and just kind of meditate on that, ruminate on that and ask yourself how your own life, how your soul is doing Uh, in accordance with each one of these things. And finally, I just want to mention this, um, because the larger catechism stresses this, that we would be right with other men uh, in our relationships. I think it's entirely appropriate and and crucially important that before we come to the Lord's table, we would also ask ourselves about our relationships with other people. There is probably no better time in your life to make a personal confession to anyone who you have hurt recently and to receive forgiveness by the same means if there's anybody else that has something against you. After all, Matthew chapter 5, let me just read this verse to you from Matthew 5. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your, your gift. So the scriptures do over and over again stress that we should make right with anybody that may be offended with us or us with them. Now, obviously, 
look, um, reconciliation is a very difficult thing. It's awkward, it's painful, but it is absolutely necessary. And supposing that you do go to somebody and try to make uh, make apology to them, there's no guarantee, of course, that they'll receive your apology in the same way that you're hoping, but you can't be both sides of the handshake, right? You can't be uh, hugs, hugs need two people, right? And it's the same thing with forgiveness and reconciliation. But the scriptures do stress that we ought to be at peace with others in as much as it relies upon us to do so. So just to review real quick, read the gospel accounts. Um, go to uh, go to the Ten Commandments, confess your sins. Perhaps look at some of your confessional material. Again, larger catechism 170 to 175 should be very helpful for you there. And then finally, in as direct and um, gentle and gracious a manner as you can, apologize and receive forgiveness from anybody uh, with whom that may be necessary. All right. Well, that's all I've got for you today. Um, Don't forget to check out the Gentle Reformation blog. It's a blog that's going to be co-posting some of my videos lately. There's a bunch of great content there from my friend Barry York, who's the the president of Reformed Presbyterian Theological Seminary, as well as some of the other professors there uh, on the faculty and some other contributors too. Great stuff over at Gentle Reformation. I'll drop a link in the description of this video. Also, hey, if you're new to Reformed Theology and you're wondering what's all this Westminster Confession type stuff, I do have uh, a book that that I wrote. It's called Hold Fast to Faith, a devotional commentary on the Westminster Confession. So if you're new to Reformed Theology, maybe that would be a good introduction for you. It's totally devotional. It's not a scholarly or academic. It's written for you to help you to understand uh, some of the great works of the Reformation era. Okay, love you lots. Uh, Thanks for checking in. Again, uh, links in the description. Check you later. Love you lots. Bye.